Hello everyone, welcome to another Immerd Inspire. Today joining me I have Jonathan Blow. Hi Jonathan, nice to meet Hello. you. Hey. It's morning there in San Francisco, right? I'm actually in Seattle, oh. Washington right now. Uh, but it's yeah, still it's morning. morning. It's a very overcast. I see you have your fire on behind you. Very yeah. cozy. Fire. Um, has the sand on stream let me know if there's any issues or you can hear either of us and we'll we'll fiddle with things so jonathan thanks so much for giving us your time um i usually start with one big question which is how did you find yourself making games or in games what got you here it, uh, i don't know man um i mean I, I was interested in games from when i was really young i i'm a little old probably compared to the audience of this podcast so um mm. Not when, when I was a kid, you know, uh, in, in the USA, um, you know, like six years old or something, there were like regular shops would have arcade video game machines in them and stuff, right? So cool. I just remember going around the corner to the like what, whatever convenience store was there and they had like an asteroids machine and a scramble or something like that. And I would play those and I just really knew that I was into those. Um, so it was the 80s didn't... then? I'm guessing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, this would be late, late seventies. Um, if I was like six, I was born in nineteen seventy-one. So. Um, so I got a ZX Spectrum. Well, our family did when I was yeah. six. It was in, uh, or maybe they got it a couple of years earlier, but it was in the yeah. mid-eighties. Yeah. And computers forced well, that, you to that was high to program. Technology, but yeah, by the time you could have something at home, that's pretty advanced. Yeah, yeah. Um, Although I, we did get an Atari 2600 when I was about eight, uh, that that I like to play. Um, I don't remember what that's called over there. We had the same thing. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Pretty much one of the first uh, consoles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I didn't really make the connection that that was something that you could do yourself uh, until I was um, I was probably about ten years old, and I was in school, and I just happened to have a computer class, which I think was a relatively rare thing in the 1970s, but because yeah. I was growing up in California and there was, you know, all, California was kind of the birthplace of a certain amount of this stuff. And I, so I think that influence like trickled down to the school where I was. And just from the first day when, when we were making computers do things, I was just super excited about it. I was like, oh man, this is like a, this is really cool. I was telling everybody about it. What computer did uh, your school have? It was a Commodore VIC-20. There was oh, a whole yeah. room. Wow, I don't know, must that is advanced. Anything. Yeah, there was, there was like, uh, you know, 40 Commodore VIC-20s in the computer room, and there was one tape drive, or no, it was a disk drive, I don't know, something like that, for the whole room. So the teacher would go, at the start of the class, you wanted to load your work, so the teacher would like push a button on the switch box to connect it to <laughs> computer one, and then you'd go hit load. And then you connect it to computer two, and you go hit load. It was really that's cool. High tech stuff. Yeah. We had uh, Apple twos, uh, probably a good ten years later than that, maybe longer, in a in a computer I room. I don't think it's ten years later necessarily. I mean, you might have used them ten years later. But yeah, they, yeah. They were not ten years subsequent to that. Um, yeah, I mean, those are sort of the big things. Like, so uh, were were you learning programming then, or I remember we used like a. Uh, Turtle script, uh, I can't remember what it was yeah. called. It was a yeah, thing. I know what you're talking about. It's like Turtle yeah. Draw or something like that. You could draw stuff, but you could also program it. You could do loops, and then you could do conditional. You could actually make games with it. Mm -hmm. um, that's not what we did. So the the class uh, in in tenth grade was um, it like programming in basic, uh, and then logo. Thank you. Yeah. Commenter. Yeah. Logo. Well, there, there was, I mean, Logo is that programming language in general, but there's a bunch of implementations, and there was one famous one on the Apple II that was called, like, Turtle something or whatever. I I don't remember the actual name of that, because I'd, I'd never had an Apple II. Um, but in, in, uh, in high school then, um, I also took a computer class, and that was on Apple IIs uh, with, um, well, we did Pascal programming on there. Cool. And that was sort of my first glimpse of more real programming, although, you know, still those classes are not particularly serious. So it wasn't until college that I got, like, 
formal programming education that was uh, reasonable and serious. But you know, prior to that, I'd gotten computers at home and was doing all sorts of hobbyist stuff for years. It's a really common story I've found is people getting access to home computers early, fiddle with them, make stuff, and they're kind of you have that mindset then later in life when you kind of have the opportunity to do things. Yeah, you know, and it's a weird thing because people these days, I don't quite understand what is going on around programming these days. So first of all, you know, people all the time ask me like, oh, how do I get started programming, right? And it's like, that's not, nobody ever wondered how to get started programming. Like, you just got excited by the ability to make computers do things and you just started doing it. And, you know, even if, even if the information available to you was, was not that interesting or not that uh, advanced, you could do something with it. And then that put you in a, in a more, uh, a more knowledgeable situation to then go seek out, you know, better ways of doing things. And that's how everything happened in the seventies and the eighties and all a lot of the 90s driven the by internet. curiosity. Yeah. Pre-internet. You just had to kind of mess yeah. around and stuff. Magazines, you remember used to come with code in them, game magazines? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Typing them in. And yeah, that's then like, you make a mistake had to debug. And, yeah, I mean, some of the later magazines, I think, put checksums in the code so you could tell that's where there was a idea. mistake. Not Those weren't the magazines I ever had. I had to figure out where I screwed no, something. No, we had, I remember typing in lines of basic. And then, you know, often there'd be, or now and again, there'd be an actual typo. So even if you typed it in properly, you have oh, to figure yeah. out what they did They did wrong. But I mean, that was the point. There was always like a, a starting off point. It wasn't great, I got the program because they're always super uh, limited. It was more like, great, I've got a thing and now I'm going to tweak it. Yeah, and now, now people ask like, what engine do you use to make games or something? And I'm like, well, that that's not that important of a question anyway. Well, I'm just writing down engine because I want to come back to that. <laughs> Is the answer because you, you make your own? <laughs> well, I, I prefer to do that. Um, but but it's also... I mean, it's a little bit of a delaying tactic or a sign that the person hasn't quite got it yet about, about programming. Because programming computers is about... It's just about uh, engaging your creativity in a specific way, right? Um, and and whatever way you use, like whatever programming language you use or whatever uh, you know tools you use, is a way that gives you the steps by which you turn that creative drive into a program that runs, right? Yeah. But the creative drive is the same thing prior to whatever tools you use, right? And sort of what I detect a lot of the time is people trying to not find that creative drive in themselves or whatever or like i don't know what it is it's just really weird when somebody asks me what's the best way to kind of jump start yeah or how do you get started or whatever and it's like so why didn't you search that on google like last week is a bit try something bit like wanting to draw but asking what the best tool is rather than just drawing with a pen and seeing what happens. Yeah. I mean, you just, whatever pen is laying around your house, you got a back of an envelope, you know, start drawing, you know, that your back of the envelope isn't going to make it into the Louvre probably, but that's fine. That's how you learn. Cool. So, yeah. Sorry. So we're talking about how you ended up in games. So you had, you had this programming uh, and access to computers quite early. I mean, I was doing the same thing, but why mm-hmm. games? I mean, where, where'd you end up with games? I just really liked games since I was a kid. I don't know. Like my, my first real program in that Commodore Vic 20 class was a stupid, stupid game. And then I just always did games at home. Um, I, I, it just was my thing. I, I was just excited by them. I don't know. I, I can't, you know, when you're that young, you don't know why you're excited by things you just are and I, I wouldn't even i mean people don't even know when they're adults but yeah that's just how it was i think people it's just the well, only thing i ever did all of us get more excited about things at a more fundamental level when we're kids yeah you don't have to explain sure. it you're just like this is so exciting yeah um question from someone relevant to what we were talking about a second ago can you draw jonathan well they didn't ask if I can draw well. <laughs> yeah. I certainly can take a pen and make lines on a paper. Um, when I was in college, I just sort of messed around for 
like a week not even reading uh, you know there's plenty of books of like how to draw and whatever and I didn't even do those I was just like uh, what happens if I start to draw I was kind of doing like um, it wasn't like a real life thing it was more like oh if I draw cartoon characters what what style do they come out in and it was a little bit interesting um, but I you know that was a week uh, 20 years ago so uh, not particularly you can always fall back on it um, so I, I want to talk a good bit about Braid. So right. obviously super well known for Braid and for The Witness. Braid, how did you end up like making that? It, it was quite a long process, right? So I've written down from 2004 to release in 2008. Yeah. Was that? I mean, it was, was that, like late 2004. So it was about, you know, three and a half years. Was that part time? Uh, or full time? Um, it was mostly full time or largely full time. Um, it was a little weird because you know at various times during development I ran out of money and then had to do contracting for other people. Okay, and at those yeah. times I was definitely part time. And I I can't tell you what percentage of development that was because I don't remember. Actually, there's a file somewhere where I have all the work that I did on Braid notated to five minute intervals. Wow. Like where I was, <laughs> like what cafe I was working at and what I was working on and stuff. Um, How come? So I probably could deduce it from that. Because um, so prior to that project, uh, for years I had been like a contractor plus working on my own games supposedly in my non-contracting time. And I had just gone for a run of years from about, uh, let's say, 2001 to 2004, maybe even 2000 to 2004, um, without finishing any of these small indie games, you know, which is fine. Like I was, you know, bringing in income from contracting and stuff. But in terms of my long term goals, you know, things were obviously not happening. So I said, well, uh, you know, maybe part of the problem is I'm goofing off enough and not really working. So um, just so that I can see how much I'm working, I'm going to start really tracking. Down. Yeah, and it was really interesting because I had, I had what I would consider a relatively distracted work style compared to today because I was, you know, like I said, going around between a lot of different cafes and restaurants and stuff. So I probably, in these quote full time days, um, I probably averaged about six hours a day of that's actual good. work, uh, which is actually for modern people that's actually pretty yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Um, these days, if I work seriously. Um, it's it's much higher like if I want to put in a full day I can easily work for 10 hours or more um, without without getting distracted um, and I would say the average is probably more like eight or something but um, what about without getting burnt you know it's a cra well, that, creative so, so work you know thing. yeah um, so during that braid time and even the contracting time before that I was actually recovering from a very serious burnout situation that I had had um, from my first company and th that was kind of part of it too was uh, you know I know that I get demotivated and don't really want to work sometimes so let me just make that visible and see if that helps and that was that was good you know probably uh, by the time I finished braid I didn't really feel the need to do that anymore um, and it's seen... also a little bit oppressive actually but have you seen a few people kind of streaming development yeah I do that sometimes too do you feel that, um, I imagine, you you know, that must force you to be focused. You can't goof off if you're live streaming. But, um, it, but it must be much harder helps. as well. Yeah, well, it's a shallower level of focus, I think, because part of your, or for me, I'll speak to only my own experience. Like part of my brain is being occupied at all times by the fact that I'm streaming and the fact that I have to verbalize what I'm doing. And that actually prevents me from going to deeper levels of concentration. Sure. Um, so I wouldn't recommend it as the primary way that people work, um, at, at least if it works for you, anything like for me. But it does, like you're saying, um, at least require you to be working on the problem for the time that you're streaming, right? Yep. And that, that really does mean that you get things done. And the thing about programming is most of the time you probably don't need to think super deeply, especially once you're experienced and you're good at it. Um, like in the beginning, when you don't really know how things go, then you just might need to focus a lot more to solve like basic stuff. 
but once you've been programming for a long time, you just crank through that stuff. And so it's just more about giving yourself the time to crank through that stuff. And then once you've cranked through and all the really basic things, you're getting a little bit of pair programming by, you know, by reasoning aloud, you know, that whole idea of just, putting yeah, it... I don't like pair programming. Well, <laughs> no one likes pair programming, but I mean, the, the concept of like, as soon as you explain your problem to someone, often you come up with a solution. Yeah. Um, I, so that's a whole thing that has become like a popular awareness thing. It's called rubber ducking or yeah. whatever. I don't work that way. Um, usually, I mean, maybe there's rare occasions, but, um, for some reason, my thought process doesn't work like that. Although I do have the related thing of like, if I think I have a bug in someone else's software and I email them, as soon as I email them about it, I figure out what the problem is. <laughs> um, in my own code, obviously. Yeah. Right? It's, it's almost always your Some own of it problem. is karma, all right, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, there's a question here um, from JRC West. How do you feel about the finish not perfect mantra, focusing on getting a project finished without spending too much time perfecting it? Well... When do you know when to release? I mean, here's the thing. That that mantra is, well, it's certainly I, I stand behind that for sure, uh, but I also don't, and it, it's complicated. Um, so the first thing is obviously that was coined by people who do not work in video games, um, because video games are so complicated and there's so much work they can never be perfect. It's completely impossible, right? It's not. It's not like it's just an infeasible amount of effort. It's like, you just can't do it. It's, it's, yep. uh, for, for many reasons that I, I don't know if we would end up going into, but, um, you just can't, can't do it. So, um, there's a very obvious problem and actually it's something that I sort of, I mean, I wouldn't say studied formally while I was making games, but I studied, like I was always thinking about this problem, uh, of, yeah. So, so let, let me say that there's two main problems in, being productive in independent game development. And when I went from that time, when I was, you know, being unproductive in my spare time until I was had successfully shipped Raid, I was thinking about what is making me unproductive and how do I solve it? And there were um, there were two two basic things. Um, wow, and I just blank. Wait, That's all right. Well, you were talking about uh, focus, so like forcing yourself to to work in blocks, I'm guessing. Um, two main things that you felt were making you unproductive or helpful. Yeah, no, before that, because I, I went on in my head to the second thing, but I want to figure out. Wow, it's too early in the morning for me. Um, whatever we were just talking about. So we were talking um, about um, finished but not perfect. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so the, the thing about... Uh, the thing about games is, uh, you know, it, as you work on them, you discover all the problems that you didn't see at the beginning, right? And so sure. they become harder to finish the more you work on them. And, uh, you know, that's not unique to games, but, uh, you know, it's a relatively well understood. Like there's a metaphor about exploring a coastline and you think you're just going to traipse along some arc of this bay or something, but terrain is actually fractal and you keep you know, getting into deeper and deeper pockets as you go around and the pathway is much longer than you thought. Um, that's definitely true for games for all sure, the time. Yeah. And so, uh, like one of those two basic skills that I identified for myself was the ability to manage that. Like you need to be able to deal with that in some way, whatever your way is. And my way, um, that I still do right now, uh, involves being very sloppy in the beginning or not very, I mean, the program still has to run, but like, I don't, we don't worry about it too much. I don't worry about, you know, memory leaks or I don't worry about, um, you know, I'm making a compiler right now, which is supposed to be a really serious thing, but like I'll put in some programming language feature and then I'll be like, yeah, I know this doesn't work in about 10% of cases, but that's fine because I'm putting it in so I can figure out how it goes and become more of an expert in a thing that works this way so that when I go fix it later, I'll know more about it and I'll be able to do a better job and like skip ahead, right? Because so yeah. if, you, if you put that feature in and you work really hard to make it good, because you're not an expert yet in how that goes, um, it's not going to be the right thing. And then you're going to have to rewrite it later anyway, right? So the idea is you, you like rough draft it out 
and then try to skip ahead as much as possible, right? But then when you get toward the middle and end of development, it's just your to-do list gets longer and longer, and that's when you just need to turn the crank and put in hours, like a lot of hours, and you know, not screw around and just debug things quickly, like be good at debugging things quickly. And so, so, so to finish off that circum the little tangent that I went on, so that's one point. And the other point was, uh, the other skill for actually getting games done is managing your own personal psychology because if your motivation falls apart and if your you will to if your will to persist falls apart, then uh, none of this other stuff can happen, right? You won't yeah. put in the hours and all that. What so. What about your belief in the project you're pushing? So you know, there's that exciting phase at the start when you you don't know how everything is going to work, and then. Mm -hmm. Towards the end, you can leverage other people's excitement, I've found, you know, once you start sharing it. Yeah, well... But there's definitely kind of a, a dead part, particularly I found in my past in on free time projects, where you're like, oh, I'm not sure, is this the right choice anymore? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you um, found that? Well, yes, but it probably works a little bit differently for everybody. Like, so people are motivated... Uh, by intrinsic or extrinsic factors to different degrees, right? So for me, um, I don't I don't care particularly much about uh, validation from external sources, like whether people say my game is good or they don't say my game is good. Or I don't care because either I know it's good or or I know it's not good, and that's what's most important to me. Um, you know, I do. It, it's nice, like when I sent Braid and the Witness out to friends initially. Um, it was good to get the feedback from them, and that does help a little bit, but I'm not that motivated by those things, whereas I get the feeling from you know questions I get that other people are much yeah. more motivated by that kind of thing. All, but there is a related a situation that, that definitely affects me, uh, which is um, there's this psychological thing that starts happening. Well, well, it's, a, it's sort of an, a progressing arc where at the beginning of development, you see, you have some vision of the thing you want to make, usually, um, and it's going to be cool, right? And then you start making it, and it's not as cool as you want it, and it doesn't really work in some cases, and all these things. And then you start making it better. Uh, but then, it, especially if it's a long project, by the time you're in the middle, and you've hopefully made it better enough, and, and made it somewhere in the neighborhood of how good your original vision was, now you're so close to it that it's not really exciting anymore, right? Yep. Um, so you have to, I always have to remember back on how excited I was at the beginning and have faith that that was well-placed excitement, right? Because now I'm just so in the grind that I can't see this thing at all. Um, that definitely happened on both Braid and The Witness, especially on The Witness, because The Witness was way longer than Braid. We said, we said Braid was long at three and a half years, but The Witness was over six years. Witness was, I wrote down, 2009 to the very start of 2016-ish. Yeah, and actually, I, that was like actual production started in 2009, but I started a prototype of The Witness, or not even, I mean, it was the same program, so it's not a prototype, but um, I started just playing around with the initial idea of the game uh, in July 2008, uh, after Braid was right done. Right after Braid went out, shipped. yeah. Yeah, so, um, and Braid... you know, calendar-wise, it was seven years from when I did that to when it, or six and a, yeah, seven years. And obviously, you'd have a lot more engine work since you switched from 2D to 3D. Yeah, for sure. You know, that's that was a lot of the beginning of development. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, that that's obviously the work you enjoy because you're also, you know, working on a programming language. The engine mm -hmm. itself, are you hoping to reuse that? Or was that just for the witness and that's that? Um, well, I'm hoping to, to reuse it for sure. Well, that, um, that'll at make those... <laughs> You know, all that effort uh, kind of pay off then for you. Oh, definitely. Um, it, it's a complicated situation, though, too, because, um, you know, I'm building this programming language, and, you know, that that sort of means that the old engine, uh, I mean, the old engine's in a different programming language, right? Or the old engine, the witness engine, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm also building a smaller, simpler game engine in the new language just to get facility in, in how to use it and to make sure the language is, you know, production quality and and that it really is better at the things that I want it to be better at than, than other languages. Um, so 
so I'm doing that. I'm building a smaller, newer game engine, but also the the established one that we put so much work into, we're going to reuse. So it's a little bit weird where we have two things going forward in parallel. Yep. Can we talk about uh, more about The Witness? Um, sure. I remember, so there's quite, obviously everyone was excited about what you're making um, because Braid was such a huge hit and you were right at the cusp of indies and digital downloads and this becoming possible, basically, what you had just done with Braid. Sure. And so obviously everyone was watching what you were going to make next. And when you did start talking about it, um, it was interesting to me. So, for example, you know, um, people were talking about this back in 2010-ish. You secretly showed mm -hmm. the game at PAX. Yes. So you just you went along with, your, I guess, your friend's booth, um, and you had mm -hmm. a space there. And the Witness was playing, but you hadn't told anyone, yeah. and there was no signs up. There was no sign. It was unlabeled. I was kind of like creeping around the periphery, <laughs> observing people play it. And it was a little bit of a um, so, non-ideal situation because it was in a relatively small booth, and the other games drew big crowds. And the idea was people would nowhere come for you to hide. play this unlabeled game. No, not nowhere for me to hide, but like the space for this uh, for this unlabeled game was uh, it was relatively encroached by by the other games, right? So there were yeah. like if it's if it's not if you can't conveniently get to this mysterious PC running something that you don't know what it is, you're probably you're not, not going to go. Going yeah, to yeah. You're if not it... going to push your way through a crowd to play that thing. And so I'd say probably like forty percent of the time, like nobody was playing it. But then. Uh, the rest of the time people were and you know some of the time people played it for a long time so there, there was one group of guys that sat down and played for probably three hours wow um, I, I mean something. in the middle of packs like while yeah, there's all yeah. this stuff and they didn't know what the game was and it was just like oh and and they they found it really interesting so that was a good sign that was did you talk to them afterwards i mean were you were you asking um, people what they thought afterwards or were you just watching not at PAX, but I happened to talk to one of those guys later on. Sure. Um, so I, I did get their their impressions of it. Um, but no, my um, for that for that appearance of the game, I mainly just wanted to see what happens when people sit down in front of it. Like, does it actually work? Because it was such a weird game, and the whole you know, or one of the many ideas was that it doesn't tutorialize you explicitly, right? It doesn't ever say in words what you should do. And yet what you're trying to do is pretty weird. And so, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I'd put together a week before PAX, I'd put together an earlier version of the current intro sequence of the game where you sort of start with a very simple panel and you then you're in this enclosed area and you have to solve some puzzles to get out of the enclosed area and then it lets you out into the main world. Yeah. And uh, that all actually worked. Like people who played that were able to successfully play it and it worked on the first try. Like since then, of course, between then and launch, we made that better, I think. Um, but that was the first time that I knew like, oh yeah, the, the idea behind this game, this approach the, the nonverbal part is gonna actually work. Yeah, Especially right. because, you know, someplace like PAX is super loud and distracting and there's people everywhere and it's hard to be subtle there. So if something works there, it'll even work better at home, you know, when you're just, playing by yourself or whatever that's cool did you show it anywhere else that i mean you know coming up closer to launch in a more traditional way yeah we did um because the so development on the witness i originally thought it was going to be much shorter than it turned out to be so in 2011 or something i said oh we, you know we're about a year a year and a half from being done this is far from true um so let's go on a press tour so you know, I went I went to New York and to London and showed the game to some journalists and, and they wrote some stuff about it at that time. And that was also that was a thing where um, I just have a hotel room and I'd sit them down and let them play the game and I would leave for an hour or two hours and then I would come back. Um, and That's not the usual it. way to do a press tour. Uh, no, but um, I think if you really want people to experience the actual gameplay, um, of your game, you don't need hover to do over that. them. Yeah, because it changes the play experience completely. Sorry. Um, and well, for this game in particular, it was such a subtle game that the the play experience gets really spoiled in a lot of ways. Um, you know, like for example, for any puzzle game, um, if you're going to run a play test to say, 
let's say you want to see if the puzzles are too hard or too frustrating or something, which yeah. is not really the way I do things, but a lot of people think that way, right? So you might sit someone down to play the puzzle game and then you're watching them to see what they do and, and all that. The problem is they know you're watching them and they're, they feel like they're being judged about how smart they are or something, right? Sure. Which then tends to fluster people and make them do less well, or that's certainly true for me. Because part of my mind is occupied with the fact that I'm being overseen and I better do well or whatever. Um, so it just changes what's happening. And so you're not really seeing what's going to happen when people play your game at home. So uh, I always I think it's very important if you if you want to really know how things go to uh, to leave people alone. That's a really good idea. And so. Yeah. No one just got stuck in scenery two minutes in and couldn't progress for an hour while you were missing. No, no. And That's in cool. fact, there were no crashes or anything. I did give them my number. I was like, oh, yeah, the yeah. crashes, call me. But <laughs> we never had that problem. So you said that was 2011, right? Yeah. So, so you were thinking, we'll release next year? Well, you know, year, year and a half. And yeah. that's the thing about games is you can't see that far ahead. Um, now, what we showed in 2011 was really ugly. Um, it was, you know, just programmer art with a light smattering of meshes, you know, authored by 3D artists that were not particularly uh, far ahead in terms of visual style or anything like that. And, um, but it, but it was playable. It was a, it was a playable game with, you and know, probably eight hours of gameplay. I get the point. feeling that's your approach. I mean, I remember you had that. I've seen um, pictures of your your early art version of braid as well mm -hmm. feel like you tend yeah, to prototype the game that. before getting art involved yeah i don't think of it as prototyping anymore though like i when people say prototyping i think that kind of means taking one aspect of a game and trying it out or mm -hmm. something um but the way i do it is more like okay we're making the real game we're just focusing on making it playable early even if the thing that's playable is a very rough drafty and doesn't have everything the final game is going to have and all that. We're incrementally building toward the final game, um, but we're we're starting by by having a playable thing. And part of the reason I developed that it may not be as relevant these days, but you know back in the 90s and 2000s and um, you know early 2010s even, there was this class like everybody built engines back then to sure. have a game because there was no alternative. Uh, and so the thing that often happened was you would start building your engine and you'd get bogged down in it and you'd never like have a playable game and then you'd go out of business or whatever. Right? Classic, or, yes. Yeah, all the time. Um, and then even, even games that, but, but that was a reasonable approach because that was kind of how everybody did things. And the common wisdom back then was like a month before a ship, you finally can play the game and then you scramble like mad to make it good and then you ship it. And it was like, I, I never liked any of that approach. Um, so, uh, you know, we, with something like The Witness, we didn't announce a ship date until we felt pretty confident that the game was what we wanted it to be. Um, and so, you know, we announced, so we launched in January 2016 and we announced that in like August 2015 or something. Yeah. Um, and you self-published, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. do you think that made it easier in that you didn't have to figure out that release date back? You know, let's say you were published by Microsoft, say. Yeah. 2011 came around. They're like, great, we'll launch in 2013 in January. And then they do loads of marketing leading up to that. Yeah, well, um, there's definite negatives to that. Like that's, if you just think about it, if your goal is to make the highest quality game possible, irrespective of sales or anything, then that's only a negative because it only, well, you might say, well, because we have a deadline. Deadline can help for sure. Yeah, yeah. but but you can always announce the deadline yourself yeah. later. <laughs> you know, so you can get that no matter what, right? And okay. then of course, if you're really not ready, you put your game into endless misery crunch like so many companies do, and, and we don't do that. Um, so there's that first of all that if you're if your metric of what you're going for is quality measured in any way sure um then that usually only hurts in in the net uh, assessment of I, things i get the feeling companies like blizzard do this as well 
where um, like work on it yeah exactly sorry you've just gone yeah, really I quiet there oh you're back um yeah so yeah. they'll they'll work away and they won't really release something until it's ready basically until they feel it's really at their quality level which is super high yeah yeah I, and i i definitely support that way of making things the problem of course is that you need to have the money to do that right so no publisher is going to give you the money to do that you can't um, get a deal where it's just pay my whole team until we feel it's ready yeah <laughs> that if you know where to get that deal let me know i would like to know <laughs> um, yeah hopefully so, we can get those deals. you know so so you kind of you kind of have to work within the cons constraints of reality that you find yourself under right but okay. i do recommend not being published or funded in that way if you can help it uh because it's definitely a it's big... almost always a problem the publisher yeah. never makes your game better right um, it, it may make it possible but yeah you don't hear about many people saying it was made better because of that deal now that said, you know, the way that we did things on The Witness probably cost us some significant money in some ways. So, for example, um, you know, we were developing it as a downloadable game for the PS4 uh, since, you know, for several years, since mm -hmm. they announced the PS4. Or before they announced the PS4, they brought us over and showed us the specs. And you were probably going to be a launch title back at that point. Yeah, we thought so. We hoped so. Um, yeah, they supported us really. I mean, we were on stage at the PS4 announcement event, you know. Um, it, Sony was really good to us. Um, uh, but, you know, I was always assuming, like, oh, it's going to be a downloadable game. And then I thought, like, oh, we should maybe get a retail publisher for this just to expand the reach of the game. And I went to Sony about it and said, hey, would you guys be interested in publishing this at retail? And, you know, they said, yeah, but... Uh, the team was excited about it, except that if your launch date is January, that's just not enough time for us to do a good job. Because our publication so they need like a, is much um, longer a, than that. A year or at least a year or something like that. Yeah, I don't know how long they need, but it, it was much. It was enough longer that they were just like, no, we can't, we can't do this. So, so there was that, and so we talked to some independent publishers, um, and we ended up not going with any of them either, um, just for retail publishing. We, yeah. There was one that. One or two that we got close with, but they all did things that were slimy publisher stuff that rubbed me the wrong way at the last minute. And then I was like, okay, if this is indicative of what the relationship is going to be like, I'd rather just only be digital. So that's what we did. Yep. And in control of it yourself. Digital simplifies things a lot, actually. So even if you find a, a digital only publisher, it is simpler. So there's not all that weird stuff like stock levels and. Uh, I can't remember the right term, but like buyback, you know, that they sell X copies, but they had to guarantee a certain amount be made and yeah. you get charged for. Right. And so because we publish our own games, we have the dashboard logins to all these online download things and we can see exactly how many people are downloading it and don't have to wonder if our publisher is cheating us or whatever. How long do you spend glued to that? Because it's hard to rip yourself uh, away from sometimes. I mean, I actually don't know... I couldn't even give you a reasonable estimate how many copies a day that we sell right now. Um, it's a couple, it, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, it's just you have to put together. So that, you know, we're on we're on Steam, uh, Mac App Store, um, iOS. Now we just launched iOS, yeah. PS4, and Xbox One, and Nvidia Shield. Oh yeah. Um, and I, I might have missed something. Um, but that's that's like a lot of platforms. They all that have their lot own of different logins and yeah. things, and it's annoying to some of them don't even like the Microsoft reporting thing just doesn't even work. Like they have a site you're supposed to the database is like slammed all the time, and you just can't see anything. So um, yeah, I just don't. You know, I'd rather think about creating things, um, but I do need to keep a vague eye on that because like. I need to know if the studio is gaining money or losing money and you know what our what that makes our time frame for releasing the next thing and so on. Based on your game Half Life, I think you have about fifteen years for your third title. Uh well, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, that could happen, but hopefully not. No, we uh we have you know, we have two things in the works, like I said, two things directly in the works and then more things planned after that. And one of them is definitely planned to be a smaller effort, and then the other one is is probably a 
close to a witness scale effort, except that you know we have this engine built already. So uh, a lot of the work is already done that that we had to do for the witness. So do you feel like you now yeah. have like a team and a workflow in place for yeah, making games I mean, it, as a studio? Th- yeah, the thing is, it does need to change for any particular game. I mean, unless you're making, you know, Call of Duty 2, Call of Duty 3, Call of Duty 4, Witness and just iterating 2, 3, and on the 4. same thing. Yeah, we're not doing that. And so <laughs> things need to shift for any particular sure. uh, effort. But but aside from that, yeah, we, we kind of have a way that, that we do things. But you, you do kind of, you know, get better at making the game you're making by the time you launch it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's actually you know not to encourage people to spend a long time making games because if you can make it quickly, you absolutely should. But when you take time on something, there are ways in which it just gets a lot better. Like you say, um, you you become an expert in making that game, right? We were an expert in building the witness by the time we were done. Um, the thing that we shipped, if we had done it as classical game development, the game that we shipped is probably The Witness 3, right? Yeah, we skipped yeah, one yeah. And, we skipped one and two and revised them into three and gave people three. Um, that is that is the more typical way. Launch something, you know, three years in. Yeah. And if it's successful, revise it and polish it up more and add more, change it obviously slightly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, which may or may not be financially the best thing, you know. I mean, it. I think in... In terms of base survival, that's maybe financially better, except maybe not because it depends on if you're a single-player game or a multiplayer game or what, right? There's certain genres of game that are about building a community over time. So anything multiplayer or anything with a really long playtime with a lot of replayability, so like The Dwarf Binding Fortress. of Isaac or something, or Dwarf Fortress, yeah. Like all those kinds of games, um, you can get like a rolling snowball of growing people interested in your game. But for stuff like The Witness, it's not like that, right? The Witness is an it's experience like a movie launching rather in the than cinema. a toy. Yeah. So, so with that kind of game, the most people who are going to play it play it on like week one, right? Sure. And then, and then it's all it's all a tale after that. Uh, you know, that's a little bit of an. It's not quite true what I said, but um, it is definitely it's big launch. And then yeah, yeah, you're Different never style. getting bigger after launch, right? Yeah, uh, except in I mean, there have been rare exceptions to that. Well, you did a huge uh, humble bundle. You did the um, kind of headlined this massive charity only humble bundle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course, I, we didn't make money from that. No, no one made money from it. But yeah. I, I think it was the biggest humble bundle ever, right? Um, I don't know the numbers behind those, but it was. I just remember raised... watching it. I was like, this is so big. Yeah. Yeah, we raised a lot of money for charity. Yeah, that, that was one. cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've got a question here from one of our viewers in the witness. As there are so many possible permutations of factors like the number of puzzles you complete, their order, number of lasers you activate, the state of the binary vases, etc., you get the yeah. feeling that there could be, even has to be, a hidden secret left somewhere in the game. So they say, I know you've said before that this question is part of the message, the meaning of the game, but were you tempted to add something like this? Adding it post-launch or in I, the game? I imagine within the game, it. something beyond what people have discovered. Even the idea yeah, I mean, of that we, kind of Easter egg. If we add something post-launch, people would like dissect the patch on Steam and find it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess I the mean, idea of, what, of really like, hidden content, you... really deeply hidden content. Because you certainly could hide it within the amount of, of interlocked systems that are there in the game. Um... It depends on what people count as the thing that they're looking for and what people count as deeply hidden and, and all that, you know. Like, so part of the thing about the Internet is if you know about most of the secret stuff in The Witness because you read about it on the Internet, then maybe it was deeply hidden and sure. you just you just read the efforts of hundreds of thousands of people hammering on this thing. So right? if the game came out uh, in 1992... <laughs> yeah, like oh, like Mist uh, actually. Mist was like in the nineteen ninety one or so, and yeah. it, it's a similar concept style of game. Yeah. So that that said, uh, I don't know if people have found everything in the game because I don't pay super close attention. Um, but as a collective, to, to it it is easier to kind of 
find out about secret stuff. Yeah, because yeah, we're all totally. connected. Yeah. And and you know, there's a certain subset of players who are really excited by that search for things. Mm. You know, and then um, and that's the real game that they're playing. You know, under under the rest of this stuff. The, and the discovery you know, and the sharing of it, you know, like getting to be in yeah. that, that early community of discovering things and telling people about it. Yeah, totally. That happened for Braid as well. There was like definitely some people who were like, oh, there's this thing in the game that's mysterious. Let's like chase it down. Um, so. What do you think about streaming, particularly around that? So Braid probably came yeah. out before streaming blew up. I mean, I'm sure it was oh, yeah. available. Streaming wasn't a thing back then. The Witness came out right in the middle of, you know, streaming is the biggest thing ever now. Do you think that... Yes. That ruins things? Uh, well, I don't exactly know. So for the not super secret stuff in The Witness, or I won't even say super secret, but for the stuff that... Um, For the stuff that Everyone is intended to be a surprise to the player. Okay. Let's say that. I do think that gets kind of spoiled if you see the stream. But yeah. apart from that, um, if someone's doing the earlier parts of the game, I'm not sure. Like, I'm not sure it's actually that streamable of a game, I guess, because the, the exciting moments happen internally to your own mind while you're figuring things out right and so if you see them happen on the screen you're not really going to get what's happening but you, you um, can buy into so a lot of people watch their favorite streamer it's more like the streamer is the entertainment rather than the game yes so yes. you'll see that that process of discovery in in your host you know that you see them figure things out and you're getting excited alongside them rather than focusing on the game and someone else is playing it for you. It's not really about that. For, yeah, I yeah, believe maybe. a lot of I, I've never had that experience for a, this particular game or actually any puzzle. I've never watched a someone game work on a puzzle games. game. Yeah. Yeah. That I hadn't. That I hadn't already. Yeah. Solved. So. Because I don't know. Maybe we, that works out. We put in like little things in our game, like renameable characters that really enabled streaming because they could name it after their viewers. And it, it didn't mm -hmm. really change our game at all, but it. It helps streamers play it. It helps them mm -hmm. play to their audience. I, yeah, I don't know how I would do the equivalent in The Witness. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I'm not sure. So it'll ask you, what is your name at the beginning? And then that fact is never used at all. You can rename each puzzle or tag it or something. Yeah. You, you hired an architect, right? Yeah, several. So we at some point had two architecture studios and about probably six individual people working on the architecture in the game. Uh, it's not totally full time because mm. you know there were studios working on multiple projects and all that. But for a couple of years, there were architects working part time on the game, and that really helped uh, the the way it feels. The I remember reading some blog posts showing kind of. Uh, you had like, you know, like a staircase leading up to somewhere. And then once you had the architect involved, they were subtle, but it makes a big difference. They were basically like, oh, no, that wouldn't work this way. And just the joints and how they stick together. Uh, and you show the before yeah. and after and you're like, oh, wow, that is way more inherently believable that, you know, it looks like real life. But you don't even, you know, realize until until it's done for you that that it was wrong. Yeah, it's the sort of thing that players are never going to consciously notice and call out but it clicks in their head just in a better way and and that that happens at detail levels like you're talking about uh, but also just stepping back like you're walking around this island and you know you see some tower with a wall around it you know it's silhouetted in a certain way and it's like when that's when that's designed in a non naive fashion it just tends to have something that doesn't happen you know, the thing that, that often happens in, in game teams is you have 3D modelers and they might work from a photo reference and put together something based on that photo reference. But the thing about that is, um, you know, they're looking at a photograph and kind of trying to do something like what's in the photograph, but probably in a different shape because for gameplay it needs to be like over here and whatever. And the thing is, when you're not educated about something, no matter what that thing is, you don't know what to look for in the picture. You don't know what's important, right? And so... Uh, you don't end up copying many of the important features of the thing because your brain just doesn't register it. 
Uh, so that that's architects are really good for telling you what's important, even even if they don't design the building. Um, but we had them design the buildings most of the time. How did you make the leap to involve them? I wouldn't think of it. Well, so early in the game, we just we had a concept artist designing locations because I was like, well, we want it to be kind of like Mist, and Mist was this, you know, wacky. It was very, um, it was very conceptual, right? Like, hey, there's this little island, and there's like a rocket ship and a sunken galleon and like an observatory all packed on this place and. What, and that's part of what's cool about it, right? Mm. Um, but when we started doing that, and I was looking at the concept images, it was like, okay, on in one dimension they're really nice, like they look like the lighting and texture in these and stuff like looks like a place that I would explore. But the actual uh, buildings and so forth just didn't really. Like, I, I knew what I was looking for deep down is like what the, I wanted the sense to be when I looked at these, and it really wasn't there because the guy didn't know about architecture, right? He was a game concept artist, you know, broadly speaking. And so I said, well, how do we solve this? And uh, it just seemed like a reasonable idea to bring architects on uh, to approach the problem. So I'm going to guess they'd never worked on a game before. No, they hadn't. And that was, um, that made things harder. Like it, it took a while just to be able to communicate, right? Because they had to learn how to explain things to us and we had to learn how to explain things to them. And the things we were explaining to them were really hard, right? Because it's not even like we're making a regular video game. We're making this game that's super subtle and where the way things look uh, is important. Very heavily determines the gameplay. Like the gameplay will get harder or easier based on minor visual style changes, right? Which is not true. I mean, that is true for almost all games, but the degree to which it's true is very small on most games. Mm -hmm. But it's very large on this game. So um, that made it just really hard. It was a difficult thing all around. It's really interesting. Um, can I talk just for a few minutes about Indie Fund? Sure. So you helped set it up, I think. Back in yeah, I, I was not one of the super. There were like two guys, uh, Ron Carmel and Aaron Isaacson, who had the idea to put it together, and then you know they sort of got together seven people originally who were okay. all you know, relatively successful. Yeah, yeah, relatively successful people who both could help fund games, but also you know kind of just have a good opinion about kind of a who, you know, men the, mentorship as well, sort of. A little bit, although, you know, we ended up not doing that that much. So okay. eh, that was probably part of the original idea, though. It was a really interesting idea. So if anyone isn't familiar with it, it's essentially a super friendly loan for yeah. a, a game. If you're trying to make it and then the loan is against the game. So much like a publisher deal, if you can't like if the game comes out and it's not successful, no problem. Um, and if it's successful, uh, really friendly uh, rate is paid back to Indie Fund. So basically, you'll, yeah, and in, you'll in never get, get a friendly after a certain point. Yeah, and you, you, it's yeah. basically the most friendly uh, loan for money possible. So you can't even go to the bank and get. You'll never get a deal this friendly from. No, the bank. I mean, dude, banks don't even fund game developers. No, no, they don't get it. Um, good, good luck. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so like in certain countries, you can get grants for game development, not in Ireland, but uh, certain other places around Europe, yeah. you can get grants and they don't need to be paid back. And that's probably the only better source. Yes. If you can get that, I encourage it. Right? But it was in, where I live. There's no such thing. So. Yeah. I mean, it's also super interesting to have, you know, a game focused. So Indie Fund was people who had made successful games before. So to have that kind of pairing of, okay, here's a source of some money, but also um, these, you know, these are, you know, really uh, experts in their domain, you know, here's people that if they think your game is worthwhile, it's probably worth pursuing as well. So I found like it was an interesting sure. matchup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it did, you know, the things changed over time, right? So between uh, when, like 2009 and now certainly you know things have changed a lot in terms of the operation broadly speaking yeah 
but, but yeah. yeah. Do you think it's still a good? W For example, uh, Irish mm -hmm. game makers here. If we're making something really interesting, should we pitch it to Indie Fund? It depends. <laughs> Um, the thing is, uh, you know, we get a lot of pitches and almost all of them are terrible, right? Um, terrible in the sense that these people probably can't even make a game, right? Like that, it's that level of bad. Because, you know, if people think they can get money, then all sorts of people are interested in that. And it's not necessarily the people who should have the money. Sure. Um, so the, there's an inherent problem there, uh, which is... When we get submissions, like knowing knowing how to go through those and even see what's good, um, so that's so even our, curating a way you just want to look at the best ones. That's a lot of work. Well, we actually we stopped doing that as our primary way of of looking at games simply because back when when we did that very officially, back when that was our primary way of trying to fund games, um, we had a less than 1% hit rate of pitches to things that we would fund. Sure. Um, in fact, I think it was like 0.5% or even lower, um, which maybe is not atypical. Like, I guess maybe venture capitalists have that kind of rate as well. I don't know. But it's just different. We're much smaller level of money than venture capital. So to work that hard to find things to fund is annoying. Um, and then... There's also a thing where you start getting hostile toward the people who are applying to you for funding because you have to like beat them away all the time. And that's not a good attitude to have because you want to help people make games, right? Yeah. And so if you're um, spending all your energy on saying no. Yeah, so so we didn't like that negativity. So we still sort of have a, a thing like that. It's still very low signal to noise and only a couple people look at it. Um, so kind of what we do now is we more actively look around for games to uh, help out. Now the problem with that approach is there's more games now being worked on independently than ever. Yeah. It's crazy now. So it's very hard for us to even know what's going on. Uh, plus we all are, we're, or most of us are working full time on projects. Sure. So it's like we do this in their spare time. So it's really, it's really actually hard to know. So it's more about if you good. notice something cool, then you'll talk to the people involved. And if if it makes sense, like they're like, oh, yeah, we're making this, but I wish we had money to hire a person. Then you're like, oh, we already have this structure. What about this? Yeah. Now, the problem is I think we are missing a lot of people that we could help out, um, but I'm not sure how to do it better. So what I would say, let's bring it around back to your original question, which is like, should people pitch their game or whatever? Um, I would say... If you've got something playable, because we're not interested in funding ideas, right? And probably have some good ideas for you. Yeah. <laughs> so do seven billion people on the planet Earth. Um, so uh, you know, if you've got a game that is playable and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to look good, because that's something that takes money and time. Um, it doesn't have to have everything that the game would have. But if I can sit down and play it, and I'm playing something that's interesting and is different from the other 10,000 things out there, right? It's not a Me Too game. Mm -hmm. um, the, and you can make a short video showing why the game is cool and send that, then totally send it to me and, and we'll look at it. Um, okay. And the reason, the reason for the video, too, is also to just sort of... It ensures that people do the work of because if it's if it's zero cost to up send something to us then everybody does it right but if it's at least like you have to at least make a video showing your game cool barts and talk about you know, it usually and, and if you're actually working on a game you've probably done that for some reason or another anyway and you have something to send right so it doesn't usually make extra work for the developer or even if it did it it's positive like, work as well okay. like that is reusable in other ways then yeah, yeah you're yeah, figuring yeah. out how to explain your game to yeah. people right um, so, and that also shifts the balance because if we just get a mysterious executable from someone, we don't know how many viruses it's got in it. We don't know how the controls work and what it's just, it's way better to start with a video. Okay. Um, that's good to know. 
But that, you know, it, assuming that you satisfy those conditions, I wouldn't mind if you email me or get, hit me up on Twitter or something. Um, Do you ever get a pitch yeah. that's just an animated GIF on Twitter? Is that too too small? Um, I don't think that in particular has happened, but I wouldn't be surprised if it happens. I've seen, that's how I've discovered some amazing games people are making. You know, it's so yeah. shareable. You know what you said about ins downloading and installing an EXE. Like, it's so low... Um, work to watch a gif that's already on twitter yeah exactly yeah <laughs> although it's hard i would say it's hard to like the things that come across in a gif like it's the style of the game or something yeah like if it's visually catchy but if you've already figured out your visual style and all that you're doing pretty good yeah you know, it, it, like you may be further along than, than some of these things that we would like to fund there's certain kinds of games like game jam games that come out and can sell themselves well in that short way but it's not every type of game for sure yeah cool well tell you what we will wrap up now wow thank okay thank you so much right yeah on. we've been talking for an hour jonathan that yeah, is time flew. super interesting thank you so much for giving your time and thanks everyone for tuning in we'll put this up on youtube later um and really brilliant to meet you jonathan if you ever find yeah, yourself thanks. in ireland let me know and i will bring you out and show you some people making games awesome do that you know i've never been there um but it would be a really interesting place to go i think it's good for holidays so thank you. yeah well although i probably want to schedule the time of year i think carefully well don't come yesterday when we had a hurricane oh god okay but yeah it was the first in 50 years so you'll probably be fine all right well thanks thanks so much thanks everyone